What's the difference between being an engineer in the public and private sector, especially at the leadership levels? In this episode of the Civil Engineering CEO, Mike Shama, President and CEO of Sam Schwartz Engineering, is going to take us through his career path, which included leadership positions in both. He's also going to talk about something that he does at the beginning of staff meetings to set a theme for the meeting. And he's also going to give the skill that he feels is most important for engineering professionals today and it's not the ability to communicate. Let's jump right in. Before we go on here, I'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, Tensar International. Check out Tensar Plus, the award-winning design software for construction professionals to design with geosynthetics and calculate their value on projects. Tensar Plus is simple to use with a powerful engineering system at its core. Whether you're designing a crane pad or need to build a temporary road over muck, the cost, time, and carbon savings can be calculated, making comparison with alternatives simple. Whatever you're working on, Tensar Plus is your toolbox for success. Now I'd like to welcome my guest onto the show for today. Michael Shama is the president and CEO at Sam Schwartz. Mike, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Thank you, Anthony. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Got the chance to uh, see Mike a few weeks ago at the ACEC conference in New York, which was nice. It's good to be getting back to conferences and getting shake hands again with people. And Mike, start us off by just telling us about the company, Sam Schwartz, where you're located, what kind of services do you provide, how, how big is the company? Yeah, sure. So the name of the company I work for is Sam Schwartz Engineering or Sam Schwartz Consulting, depending what state you're working in. Uh, it's a company that Sam Schwartz started 27 years ago. So Sam had a distinguished career in the public sector working for New York City DOT. At one point, he was commissioner of uh, city traffic, and then he was chief engineer for New York City DOT. So he went out after the public sector. He uh, worked for a consulting firm, and then he started his own uh, started out with just Sam and one intern as a traffic engineering firm uh, doing work for the private sector in New York City. It since uh, has grown now to, uh, we have nine offices around the country. We have 160 employees and offer a, a, a range of services to our clients. So our offices, we're still headquartered in New York and that's still our biggest office. Our second biggest office is Chicago. And then we have offices in uh, Jersey City, Philadelphia. Uh, on the West Coast, we have three offices, Seattle, Oakland, and Los Angeles. We have an office in DC and an office in Tampa. So those are our office locations, but we actually do work. I think so far we've done work in 38 states and we've done also work in Canada. So we, as we like to say, we punch above our weight. Uh, we do work now for the public sector and the private sector. So. I would say 70 to 75% of what we do is for the public sector. Our biggest clients there tend to be city DOTs or state DOTs. And, uh, and uh, we do, you know, we work with big tech companies and uh, innovative companies in, in the mobility and transportation space. We also work with developers. We do environmental uh, planning for big developments. A lot of it is in New York City, but we do that outside of New York City as well. Our biggest service by far, I think, is still, it's kind of a split between transportation planning and traffic engineering. So those are the two biggest uh, ones. But as I mentioned, we do environmental planning, transit planning, civil engineering, outreach, and data analytics, uh, all, all kinds of things. We tend to focus, I, I like to think of us as an urban firm. So we tend to uh, be really good at solving complex issues in an urban environment in an urban setting and probably more than 90% of what we do is, a, is in an urban setting. Uh, we also, you know, we think of cities and also if you think of a place that's not a city like an airport or a sports event or something like that where it becomes a temporary city, uh, we do solve those logistical transportation and movement problems as well. So that's where we are today. I think we have 160 employees at this point. Okay, that's great. 
Yeah, I had the opportunity in the past to visit the office there and interview Sam Schwartz for the Civil Engineering Podcast, which is out there for those of you that are heavy into transportation. And if you live or from the New York area like I am, you may have heard of Gridlock Sam, which is <laughs> Sam Schwartz. So, um, but it's interesting to hear. It sounds like the company's certainly <clears throat> growing from you know when I was there last. So that that's good to hear. Uh, and so, Mike, take us through your career a little bit. You spent much of the early part of your career in the public sector. Talk to us about kind of what made you go that route and then how and when did you feel like it was time to transition into the private sector? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I'm an immigrant. I came to this country when I was 20 years old. Um, I learned English actually when I got here. Um, and I ended up going to uh, upstate New York, uh, a university named Rensselaer or RPI, some people call it. I graduated from there in December of 87, which was a very tough time uh, for those who were working then, uh, the economy wasn't that great. So I remember sending out a hundred letters. We actually didn't have emails back then. We, so we sent letters <laughs> asking for employment opportunities. I applied to a hundred different companies. I ended up with two responses. One was uh, from a small company in Cape Cod. And another company was in the Helderberg <laughs> Mountains, uh, south of Albany. So it's a uh, East Burn, New York, very small firm, two engineers, one sort of licensed land surveyor, about 10 staff. Uh, honestly, I had no money to move to Cape Cod, even though it sounded interesting. So I ended up going to work for the company in East Burn. I worked there for a year and then the economy was still pretty bad. So I had a feeling if I stayed, things would probably get laid off or something because I could see the amount of work that was coming in. So at the time, my wife suggested, why don't you think about the public sector? So it was really a... a uh, by accident, I ended up in the public sector. And I said, do what? I mean, I again, you know, I, I didn't know as much I should have as I should have known back then in terms of public sector opportunities, but I ended up taking a civil service test. I passed. I uh, ended up at New York State DOT. Uh, and I actually got hired during a hiring freeze. That's how bad things were. Mm -hmm. But they had uh, permission to fill one position in planning. I ended up working in planning uh, for two and a half years. The economy was still not that great, so I was on the layoff bubble. And uh, instead of laying me off, uh, unfortunately, somebody else who had less, less seniority than me uh, got laid off in, in uh, geotechnical engineering field. Um, so one day, uh, they basically moved me from planning to geotechnical engineering. Hmm. So I was the last. If they laid off one more person, that would have been me. So I ended up in geotechnical engineering, which I really enjoyed. Uh, I learned a lot. And my desire at the time was to be known as a great designer for geotechnical engineering, uh, foundations for roadways and, and bridges. But about uh, three years into that, my boss asked me to do something. He asked me to manage one of the labs, the soil mechanics lab. And I didn't want to do it because I liked the design work, but he said, Mike, you have a good personality. People seem to respond to you. Um, we're having some personnel issues. I would like you to do that and, and help me out. And I said, okay, yeah. can I do it just for one year and then come out and go back into design? He said, sure. And he was true to his word. I did it for one year. I came out, except he didn't put me back in design. He put me in a job where I was a liaison traveling between main office and regions and looking at construction projects, making sure they were uh, being built as you were designed. Um, you know, I didn't really enjoy that that much. So I ended up uh, moving to another part of DOT, which was uh, 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 traffic data monitoring. So I was responsible for monitoring uh, all the, collecting all traffic data and analysis for the whole state of New York. So, you know, eventually, um, I ended up another part of planning, uh, but a, at that point, uh, honestly, my you know I was thinking of my career. I was happy that I had a job. I was happy that I was contributing, but I haven't thought about leadership opportunities. I just haven't thought of myself as as a leader uh, until I went to a conference and I heard one of the regional directors talk about leadership. And at that point, I I don't know. I'm trying to remember if I ever heard anyone say leadership. I think that was like a shock to my system, you know, engineers talking about leadership. So I, it was very intriguing to me that, and that kind of sent me on a, on a road of thinking about what my future is. And, you know, you do some self-examination 
And I decided, you know, maybe I had the self-confidence or arrogance or whatever you want to call it to think that I can contribute at a higher level. So, and, and that's really what it was for me. It wasn't about promotion. It, was about, it wasn't about money. It was just, I thought I had more to give and where I was, I was limited. So I did a, a plan for myself to, um, I wanted to move up in the organization. I figured out how to do it. And then six years later, I was a chief engineer for the state of New York, hmm. for all of New York State DOT. So, uh, you know, after that, politics changed. One governor goes out, one governor comes in. So they asked me to do something different, which was uh, be one of the regional directors uh, in, in uh, Utica, New York, so central part of the state. So if you recall, the, the guy who got me thinking about leadership was regional director. He was regional director in that region. So I kind of ended up following in his footsteps. And I did that for five years, and and probably that was one of the most enjoyable jobs I ever had because it's like running a small DOT. So I had 300 employees are white collar, 350 that were blue collar. Um, you know, we were responsible for plowing the snow and building projects and interacting with communities. So that was great. After that, um, I ended up going to the Thruway Authority where I became the chief engineer for the Thruway Authority and the Canal Corporation. And uh, I worked on the replacement of the Tappan Zee Bridge at the time, which was first design build in New York and a mega project. And that was a great opportunity. Uh, and, and for me, it's, you know, the idea is to continue to learn every day. Mm -hmm. So I've been fortunate in my career that, that I've continued to do that. You know, after at, at that point. So, so Mike, before you go further, I want to just yeah. dig into a couple of things you said there. First of all, which is why I like doing these interviews, because if you look at Mike's LinkedIn profile, you're not going to see that he was one person away from getting laid, <laughs> laid off at the, uh, when he was working, you know, when he got into the public sector, working at the the DOT. But I think that speaks a little bit to, you know, just continuing, you know, just staying mm -hmm. determined, staying persistent, keep doing your job. Hey, that, that could have been me, but I'm just going to keep going. So I thought that that was interesting. I think the other thing that you said that I think probably resonates with a lot of engineers out there that may be, may be watching is the whole idea of leadership, right? Because mm -hmm. I have this conversation with a lot of the clients we work with in terms of like their training programs and their career development and career pathing. And I think when you come out as an engineer, we're analytical. We did a ton of technical training in school and we just mm -hmm. want to keep doing it. We jump in, we start doing reports and calculations and, you know, like you said, getting out there, traffic analysis, different types of things. And I don't know when and where the whole idea of like management leadership, you know, gets introduced. It's, it's different for every person. It probably depends on every person's mm -hmm. situation, but it was just interesting to me the way you said it in that, you know, you never really thought about it, which just means that it wasn't really like mm -hmm. in front of you, you know, and, and, right. and I think another kind of benefit or another thing to highlight there is that Mike learned about at a conference, which I always tell people get out there. You know, meet people, go to mm -hmm. events, get involved in your associations, get on committees, right? Mm -hmm. And so Mike heard about it at one of these events and then decided to pursue it and look into it a little bit more. Um, so, Mike, going back to that point in time, when you heard about leadership and, you you know, what made mm -hmm. you interested enough to really go down that road? Was it just like you're like you said, maybe it was just you felt like you could do it. You felt like you could contribute or. Yeah, you know, it's funny. After I, I heard about it, I started buying books like crazy and reading them about leadership. I have a big library that of, of books that I've read, and I listen to podcasts, uh, YouTubes. And it, it just, uh, you know, one of the things I read somewhere, it says, if you want to be a leader of people, you have to like people. So for me, I like interacting with people. And even though we're in the business of engineering, honestly, any business that you're in, you're in the business of people. You know, you have a team that you're doing, you know, that you have to influence, you have to mentor, you have to coach. So it really appealed to me. I still like engineering. I'm an engineer, obviously, but but uh, it, what I liked about it, especially that I was uh, thrust into management by my boss when I was in geotechnical engineering, I, I ended up leading a team of uh, 22 people, but I had zero training. Uh, I don't know if I was a good manager or not. I, I will say I was not a leader. I was just a manager. So it, it was just intriguing to me that you could actually be a leader and, and influence a team to do better things, good things, improve their, their own lives, improve their own understanding of engineering and, and organization. So it's just something that really appealed to me, that combination 
of engineering and leadership. And since I didn't know anything about it, I said, I want to I want to find out more. And and that's when I started uh, learning about it more. So I, I never waste an opportunity to, you know, buy a book that I hear about and read it or, or interact with someone as, as yourself uh, or, you know, go to a conference and listen to something. I mean, I've enjoyed uh, listening to you a couple of times now at these ACEC conferences. Yeah. So getting back to the whole idea of interacting with people and people skills for you, you said you liked interacting with people. Do you feel like it was something that you were always generally good at? Like you had the ability to interact with people or is it something that you felt like you really had to develop? Cause I think a lot of engineers worry mm -hmm. about that, that they may not be good at that. Yeah. I mean, growing up, I mean, you would never know it now when I tell people they, they laugh because they think I'm kidding, but I'm not, I was very shy. I was a very shy kid. I had not no confidence and uh, it's something that I had to, tell myself like on purpose, you have to be more confident. You have to do this. You have to do that. And, and I would put myself in, in situations that were very uncomfortable for me. So when I first came here to, to the U S like I said, I couldn't speak English that well. So if a professor called on me to say something in class, I mean, you know, I'd get nervous, I would sweat, I would shake, uh, my voice would crack and but because of that, it upset me so much that it was like that, that I said, I have to get better at speaking. Mm -hmm. So uh, even to this day, I, you know, I've been in the U.S. 39 years. I'm always working on improving my English. I'm always working on improving my communication style. Uh, any opportunity to speak, I used to throw myself out there. I said, I'll do it. I'll volunteer. I'll speak. Even though, you know, it made me nervous as hell. Now I'm less nervous. Uh, I don't think you ever get over being nervous because you always want to do a good job. I mean, people are spending time listening to you, so you want to give them value for their time. Uh, but, uh, you know, that that's kind of like the journey that I went on in terms of, uh, um, you know, learning how to interact with people more, speak with them more, listen to them more. Uh, is, is it something that's natural to me? I think it's something I had to develop. It wasn't like uh, innately. I mean, I, I like people. I like having friends, you know, but there wasn't, you know, uh, something that I was aware of that I could lead a team of people or actually communicate at a conference with 500 people. It's something I had to learn over time. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, I've, you know, I've known Mike for a few years and I never knew until today that English wasn't your first language. So you've done a tremendous <laughs> job. And I, I will say too, I know we kind of glanced over a little bit, but I mean, that's certainly something that is a very, very difficult challenge coming to a country at 20 years old, not being able to speak the language and then kind of having to go into engineering school nonetheless, which mm -hmm. is very complex and lots of different topics. And and I do think though, if there, if there's like kind of an analogy to think about for, for, you, for those of you out there is that if you don't have another option, Mm -hmm. right? Then you only have one way to go. Like you, you got thrown into this school. And like you said, I didn't want people to yeah. like the professor. And like, so you really, it really kind of ultimate accountability for yourself was I got to learn this or I'm going to have to deal with this in class. And so I say that just because some of you out there may be in the same situation. I know I talk to engineers all the time that are, that have come to the U S and they're integrating and they're trying to learn English at the same time as learning engineering. So this may be inspiring for you in that regard, but also just anyone who's trying to take on a new challenge in their career or their life, for example, trying to get your PE license, you know, instead of just mm -hmm. studying for the exam, tell tell your boss you're taking the exam in a month, like put some pressure on yourself, put some accountability mm -hmm. on yourself because that's going to force you to show up every day, do your preparation and get better. Um, if you commit to doing a lunch and learn in front of your entire company, if you're uncomfortable with public speaking, it's going to force you to get better and force you to show up and force you to do it. So I think anytime you can put yourself in a situation like Mike said, where you're a little bit uncomfortable, you're outside of your comfort zone, that's going to be like the ultimate way to grow in my, in my experience. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a big deal. So, all right. So let's go back to your career. So you went to, you were at the DOT, uh, you were at the Thruway Authority. What was that, like 20 or so years into your career, 20, 25 years? Yeah, about 26 and a half, I would say, uh, okay. the, in the public sector. Um, so, you know, I was at the Thruway Authority. I, I was having you know, a good time. I'm enjoying it. I'm really loving what I'm doing. Developed a really good asset management system for the Thruway. Uh, but then an opportunity came about to uh, join the private sector, which is something I always knew I would end up back in the private sector uh, after I 
you know, finish my career in the, in the public sector. You know, I had planned on being in the public sector for 30 years. So I left a little bit short of that, but I had a, an opportunity at the time. The economy was great. Um, you just never know, like if I retire at 30 years from the state, what the economy would look like, what the opportunities would look like. So I ended up being the president of a small, I guess, mid-sized engineering company named Hax that did a lot of construction uh, management in New York City. And I, I came out of the public sector as the president of this company, which it's it, not common. I, I would say that you come out of government and you go into leadership in a, in, in a private sector. You may come out as a senior vice president, you know, vice president, um, but I actually... You know, I, I was the president of the company, leading the entire company of 650 people. So mm. that was an opportunity I did not want to turn down. Uh, and at the same time, uh, a headhunter reached out to me uh, for an interview to be the the uh, chief engineer at Amtrak. Mm. So those were the opportunities: be the chief engineer at Thruway, be the chief engineer at Amtrak, which is something I've already done twice, and mm. or or become the president of a private uh, engineering company and. Uh, I, that's the option that I selected. Hmm. So when you took that job, what was your confidence level and your abilities being that, like you said, you're coming out of the public sector for such a long time. And not only are you stepping yeah. into the private world, but now you're, you're, you're tasked with leading an organization of that many people. Talk to hmm. me about your mindset when you took that job. Yeah. It's funny. One time I remember my, my wife saying to me, it's like, when you get a job, like, and you go in, it's a job that you've never done before. Like, how do you know? How do you know that you can do it? Like, what do you what do you do on your first day? I said, I figured it out, right? And and there's one thing I, I always tell people that if you're good at one job, you're not necessarily good at another one, mm -hmm. right? Every job is very different. So, what I do when when I get the uh, the opportunity to do something different, I I do a lot of thinking about it upfront, and I say, what is my approach going to be to this specific position, this specific job? And it can be the same exact thing that I did in the last one. It has to be unique. Uh, the very first thing I, I, I do is I, I learn about the people that I'm going to be working with, the people I'm going to be leading with. them, And I meet with them one-on-one -on -one because I, I don't want to be the first interaction for me to come in and be in a room of 12 people who've never met me before, right? So I, I like to carve out time. Sometimes I do it even before I start. So when I start, I already know them. So I call them. I, I meet with them one-on-one. -on -one, I have coffee. I ask them about themselves. I ask them what their uh, aspirations are, what their goals are, what they're proud of, what they're afraid of, you know, things like that. So I try to get an understanding of them. I tell them about my leadership style. So when I come into an organization, again, it's not about me. It's about the organization. It's about leading a team and making sure that they continue to succeed. I've been fortunate that the companies that have gone into, um, they're doing fine without me. My job is to make them do more fine, more, you know, grow and, and do better. So that, that's that's what I do. So for every position that, that I've uh, had the fortune of being in, I, I try to develop a specific strategy that is unique to that position. That's great. But that strategy is all based around having conversations with the people that you're going to be working with. Yeah. I mean, you do a lot of research on the company itself. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's it. I'm not doing all the work. I'm just leading the team that's doing the work. Uh, right. So my job is to provide that vision and that leadership and so forth. One thing I'm very, uh, you know, aware of is like you. You don't come in into an organization and say, "Okay, we're going to change everything." And I mean, that's <laughs> uh, people don't like revolutions. They like evolution. So if I see something that needs to be changed, you know, I work with that person to make sure that we change it together as opposed to me saying, okay, stop, you got to do this differently now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I've been in organizations, actually, I mean, I, there was a couple of times where I was at DOT uh, and the throughway where something wasn't really working that great. Right. So, you know, I made some process improvements. I made some uh, personnel <laughs> changes, uh, but I do it in a way that doesn't embarrass anyone uh, you know, I do it in a way that that's it's collaborative. And and over time, I would say, you know, early in my career, when I was uh, put into management positions without training, uh, you know, you make mistakes and you learn from those mistakes. But uh, I'm happy to say the mistakes that I've made, they were never at the expense 
of disrespecting like you know somebody's dignity or something like that because that's something i've always yeah you know understood that you treat people with respect that's great but, yeah and i like the i like that strategy of really getting those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people early on in your time in an organization to start to understand people and you know how they how they how they work their work styles their personalities so yeah. you mentioned there you talk to them about your leadership style. Tell, mm -hmm. tell us about what you, how would you describe your leadership style? So that's, you know, that's something also that has evolved over time. I mean, you know, everything about you as a human being should evolve over time, right? Sure. You should never be the same person. If, if I slice time every five years and I talk to you, you should be a different person. Your core values should be the same, but your, your knowledge and your techniques and your strategies, all these things should be different. So, uh, my leadership style now, I would say it's servant leadership. Uh, you know, my job is is simply to be in the, at the service of others. They don't work for me. I work for them. So my job is to, you know, understand the, the company, understand the trends outside the company, and understand how to position the company to be successful. So I'll give you an example. When, when the uh, Infrastructure Act, the uh, the infrastructure and and, and uh, jobs act, uh, you know, was was passed. I mean, even before it was passed, I would listen to Secretary Buttigieg and President Biden, and I would see what is it going to look like for our sector of the economy, and then I would position our company to be successful in terms of interacting with the clients who are getting the funding. And for, fortunately for Sam Schwartz, we're very well aligned with what the, what the funding categories are. So for instance, is, you know, electrification, zero emissions, uh, smart streets, uh, you know, vision zero, equity. I mean, a lot of the transit funding is increased. So all the things that we're very passionate about, but then I would look at the company structure and the company expertise. And, and if we weren't aligned with that, I would make sure we're aligned with that. So that's my job is to set that vision, make sure that, you know, I provide an environment where we're going to succeed and communicate that vision clearly so everybody understands what's expected of them. And then, and then my job is to step back and make sure that they have everything they need to succeed. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I do. That's great. Cause I think that that's one of the biggest, I don't know if I say challenges, but as a leader, like you have to have that visionary strategic mindset, like you mentioned, where you're mm -hmm. looking at the big picture in your industry, you're looking at the trends so that you could position the company in the right way but then also you're not the one doing the work but you do need to figure out how to take the strategy and then get it down to the ground so that things can be put in motion to capture mm -hmm. those opportunities right and so i think that's where the leadership and the communication come into play so that you know everyone could have big ideas and know hey the funding's coming this is coming but you got to you got to position you got to you know got to move the company exactly. away to to be able to grab those opportunities so i always mm -hmm. think that that's a fascinating aspect of leadership you have to be able to do both of those things really well but i think at the same time like you said but you're not the one who's actually going to ultimately be doing the work necessarily which is why you need to put people in that position and help them yeah, I mean, it's, a, you know, I, I love the Wayne Gretzky saying, you don't go where the puck is, you go where the puck is going to be, right? right. So it's, it's a, you know, pre-positioning. So you, 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 you are going to be successful. You don't always get it right, right, but you do your best to under, I mean, you know, you look now at what the economists are saying, right? Half of them are telling you there's going to be a recession. The other half are saying there's not going to be a recession. So it, it's not always clear where you need to be. So you have to trust your gut instinct. Uh, you know, for instance, I look at the private sector and, and it, so, so again, 70 to 75 percent of what we do is public. The rest is private. So I'm comfortable with the public sector stuff because for the next five years, I think there's going to be enough funding. And I don't think, you know, who's in the White House, who's in Congress is really going to change that picture. But the vulnerability here, the risk is on the private sector. So if the interest rates continue to go up, what is the private sector going to do? Right. So even but we, even within the private sector, I think there are opportunities because there are institutions like hospitals and universities. I mean, they don't stop money because of the economy is, is on a downturn. So you, again, you have to position your resources and say, okay, if the development work goes down, is there another source in the private sector that I can do work with? So you kind of do all these mm -hmm. analysis and make sure that you understand the risks that you have that are coming up and then you, you 
put yourself in a position that you, you're you never going to eliminate all the risk, but you try to minimize its impact on your company. That's great. Yeah, I went to uh, at the conference that we were at together last month, I went to one session that was all about like the finance and trends in the industry and stuff. And it was like, the gentleman seemed very knowledgeable, but throughout the talk, he was like, you know, this looks doesn't look good, doesn't look good, doesn't look good. And then at the end, he was kind of like, but a lot of infrastructure money's coming, so everything's good. I was just <laughs> like, it was like a bit of a, a bit of a roller coaster. But yeah. um, but anyway, all right, so let's take so take us to Sam Schwartz. How, how did you get there? Yeah, so it's, you know, a lot of times I always tell people life is about plan B, right? Sometimes things happen because you want them to happen. Sometimes things happen just by accident. So it's like when I was working in planning and I got moved to geotechnical engineering, it's not something I seeked out, it just happened. So this was the same thing. So I was working for a company named Gannett Fleming at, at the time, which is another great company. And, uh, you know, I was I was fine, but... Uh, but I thought I could contribute more than what I was doing at the time. And uh, just through contacts and a friend of mine who used to work for Sam Schwartz, uh, he knew that Sam wanted to transition leadership and you know basically step out of the CEO position and do other things. Uh, and he had a two and a half year window. So uh, Sam has asked this person to help him find somebody. So. He provided Sam with a whole bunch of names, um, you know, leaders, known leaders in the industry. And uh, it's actually someone I met at an ACEC conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you know, let's do lunch. So we did lunch. I didn't know at the time, you know, why we we're having lunch, but <laughs> I like to eat and I like the guy. So uh, and he was kind of like feeling me out and, and started asking me a bunch of questions about my background. And then at one point he said, you know what, I think you'd be a perfect fit. I said, for what? And then he said, well, Sam is looking for some. It's like, are you interested in talking to him? I said, sure, absolutely. I like Sam. Like you said, I mean, if you live in New York and you don't know Sam, good luck. I mean, he's like a legend, right? right? So, I mean, to me, it's like an honor to even be just talking to the guy sure. who coined the phrase good luck. And, you know, he always thinks different than most people. And so I met Sam and, and I liked him and he liked me. But, you know, we did. That was in the summer. We didn't really do anything. Uh, about it. Uh, we kind of like were exploring and I think he was still talking to other folks. Uh, uh, but then again, another coincidence, um, we ended up both serving on a panel uh, that was to figure out the funding of the MTA by, by accident. So he was appointed by the governor. I was appointed by the Senate through a contact that I had. Uh, they called me and they said, the Senate is looking for someone to serve on this panel. Are you interested? I said, what does it involve? Like, and they said, I don't know, talk to the senator. So I talked to the senator again, we made a connection and uh, he said, I want you to be my representative on this panel. I said, be happy to do it. So Sam and I now are sitting side by side, working together for four months. And it was like on a job interview kind of thing, right? So <laughs> he saw how I interacted with my peers, with elected officials. And even though we didn't believe it or not, we didn't agree on everything. He liked my style. I liked his style. And uh, I think at the end of the day, like Sam is very big on integrity and ethics. And I think he could see that. And, and so am I. So, you know, he could see that. Uh, the panel concluded in December. And uh, I told him at that point, I said, I think I'm ready. You know, I want to work with you. And then I started in February. No, wow. that's awesome. And um, yeah. And so talk about, Sam Schwartz now and how the company's growing. I'm sure, you know, in the market today, it's a very busy market. Things seem mm -hmm. to be relatively good. You know, you said you're about a hundred, would you say 150, 160 people? Yeah, 160. Yeah. Okay. 160 people. So as you think about the future and everything that's happening, infrastructure funding, what does growth look like for your firm going mm -hmm. forward here? Yeah, so we, you know, Sam Schwartz. I mean, with the exception, I think at one time the, the growth has been organic. Um, I think they bought a small company before my time in Chicago, but you know, most of the people had left, and a couple of them stayed, and and now Chicago is our second biggest office. So we do have. Uh, I mean, for me, there is no reason why a company couldn't double in size every five years. So that equates to about fifteen percent growth uh, every year to year compounded. Uh, so our strategy at this point is to grow 
organically to say maybe about 75% of that and then do a small acquisition to account for the rest of it. So, you know, how do you, how do, you do that growth, right? I mean, so the, I always tell people the easiest client to get is the one you already have, right? Mm -hmm. Because the client, that I mean, there's, they already know you. Hopefully you're doing a good job for them. So they like you. Right. And then they're going to continue to give you more work. So there's less energy. I mean, it's not no energy. Obviously, there's a lot of energy in delivering good quality work and making sure you understand them and you're giving them what they need. But to go get a new client takes a lot of energy and marketing and work and things like that. So we defend the clients that we have. Our clients that we have tend to be long term. They always come back to us. But, you know, you always want to cultivate new clients. So we try to figure out like, who those are. And as I mentioned, you know, I like the split of 70, 30 public, private. I think that's that's a good mix. Um, you know, we try to do that. We try to see where the economy is going, who's doing what. Um, and and then we grow, you know, we're always getting uh, exposed to new clients. So we, you know, our two offices, New York and Chicago are good size, not, not to say that they can grow, but we have smaller offices throughout the, the country. So my first priority is to grow those smaller offices. So then each office could mirror the other two in terms of offering all the services that we offer. Um, I like that. And, and, and we might open, I would say in the next five years, a couple of new offices. We're looking at states that are uh, doing very well. Uh, like, you know, uh, we, we already have an office in Florida that's doing well. We got offices on the West Coast. We have no offices in Texas. So I could see Texas as a, sure. as a growth opportunity. Uh, and, and there's a couple other states that we're looking at as well. That's great. Yeah, and I think that that's a good plan in that. I think one of the mistakes some firms have made that I've seen is just trying to grow too fast. And I think when mm -hmm. you try to grow too fast you know, bad things can happen. Bad things yeah. can happen to your existing offices. Like you're, you're saying, you're, you know, you want to take your existing offices and really develop them and make sure that they're doing very well on their own before you start you right. know, stretching yourself thin. Um, in fact, one of the um, CEOs that I had on recently, uh, Gil Hanch from MSA had used the term, you know, we wanted to build with bricks, not sticks, you know, because you right. can go fast right. and, and things can break. So, so I like that approach a lot. I think organic is, is a good approach and I, and I, and I wish you the best with that. I want to switch gears though now, because sure. one of the areas that engineering professionals tend to lack knowledge in is kind of the finance or the business side of engineering. And mm -hmm. in your career, like we've talked about, you've had to spend kind of a lot of time in leadership, and I'm sure you've gotten involved in the finance side of projects, especially in the public mm -hmm. sector. I know you oversaw uh, a $1.5 billion capital program at the New York State Thruway Authority. So talk a little bit about how your experience on the finance or the business side helped you in your career just from a leadership perspective. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, engineers, obviously, are, we're good with numbers, right? But finance is, is different than numbers. I mean, yeah, you know, to be able to do a spreadsheet or uh, design a bridge or something like that, it's not the same as as managing a, a large pot of money. I mean, and it's a very different thing in the public and in the private sector. I always, uh, you know, people ask me when, when I uh, came to the private side, they said, what's the big difference? I said, on the public side, people give you money to spend. On the private side, you have to make the money, right? So it's a very <laughs> different. So it, on, on the public side, you know, we have yearly budgets. I mean, you have to get the, the legislators and the governors to give you a certain amount of money. So you have to show the needs. And then the federal money gives you, the federal uh, government gives you money based on the amount of infrastructure and use that you have. And so there's different pots of money. This is New York State DOT, not the throughway. The throughway was TOLTS. I mean, that was really our source of uh, revenue. So, and and money is not fungible, right? So it's it has like the certain monies are dedicated for certain uses and you have to figure out all these different things of how much money you have for bridge, how much money you have for highway, how much money you have for mobility. And at the end of the day, what I've, throughout my career, I, I think this is, probably a very good thing to remember is that you're always funded at about 60% of what you actually need. You're yeah. never, ever going to have all the money that you need to do everything right. So then you have to be very good at understanding the sources of money, what you can use it for, couple that with the needs that you have and make sure that you understand the 
true conditions of the assets that you have and how to allocate those monies. And at what point in time do you go out there and spend that money on that specific asset? So it becomes really more about that. On the private side, at the end of the day, you live and die by your cash flow, right? So it's a different situation. So, and I'll give you an example of something that will resonate with people. <clears throat> a lot of times when you do the work and then you bill a client and you get paid, they call that day sales outstanding. So you have, you may have 60 days to collect the money. You may have 90 days to collect the money. Let's say it takes 90 days to collect the money. In those 90 days, just think about how many payrolls you made. Mm. You've already paid your staff, what, six times? You paid the rent three times. You paid, you know, so you, you're paying all these different things before the client even pays you. So if you don't manage your cash flow on daily basis, it could really yeah. kill you, right? That's that's the number one thing. The number two thing I would say, I mean, you still, you have to be a little bit of an accountant sometimes to understand balance sheets and income statements and dealing with attorneys and, and taxes and things like that. But for most engineers, they're not going to deal with that. Most engineers are going to deal with a project management, right? So you're managing a schedule, you're managing a budget. So you really have to be very good at, at I mean, you have to serve the client, but you also have to serve your company. So you have to give the client what they need and more, but you also have to make money. So you have to manage, you know, the expenditure of time, the expenditure of budget, how you're allocating the resources and make sure that you, you know, you do all of it while still making a profit because you want to make that profit so you can stay healthy. You can invest in more, you know, in the company and the people of the company and, and, and continue to grow. So very, very different skill sets mm -hmm. on the public and on the private side when it comes to finances. Uh, you know, if you want to be in leadership positions, obviously you have to understand all these things depending on where you are, public or private. Yeah. Yeah, and I think going back to that example you gave, which is a good one about the 60 or 90 days in terms of getting mm -hmm. your money. When we do training, whether it's project management training or sometimes we'll do like a consulting one-on-one -on -one program for our clients just so they can educate their professionals, especially their younger professionals about the cash flow cycle. Because, you know, we mm -hmm. just were told, we're told to enter hours into a timesheet. We don't know what it's for, yeah. right? right, so, right. so I think that's a really good example to give your staff. You know, every, everyone out there should do that early on in their careers. But I think even taking it one step further – is not only is it a problem if you you know take longer to get the money and after you've invoiced it, but a lot of times what happens is people don't get their invoices out, right? Yeah. Like when they're supposed to. So if your invoice is a week or two weeks or God forbid a month late, now you're talking about you're adding a cycle onto that. Like Mike was mm -hmm. saying, that's two more payrolls. That's another month's rent. That's and mm -hmm. just because you didn't actually get the invoice, that's not even on the client. That's on you. And that's why, you know, in terms of project managers or business managers, however you want to think about it. That's why understanding the finance of your organization and how it works is very important to the bottom line of the company, which is directly comes back to your performance, of course. But I think the other thing, Mike, that I'm sure was very helpful for you or anyone in the public sector is actually having to justify your projects, like you said, yeah. to get funding, because I can see how many different skill sets you have to use through that process. It's like you're doing sales, essentially, right? You're selling your Basically, projects. Basically, yeah. You're interacting with people, you're presenting things, you're doing numbers. So I can really see as we talk through everything, how your experience in the public sector really helped you to build so many different skill sets, you know, that mm -hmm. were able to really transfer into the private sector and help you to become a very well-rounded leader, I would think. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, one thing, I mean, people sometimes ask me like, which is harder, which one do you like better? I like them both. I, whatever I'm doing at the time, I like what I'm doing at the time. You know, I focus on it, but to me, uh, I think it's much harder to manage in the, uh, and lead in the public sector than it is in the private sector. There are more dimensions to it. It's very complex. You're also dealing with the politics of it. Not that you don't on the private side, but you know, it's like a, an elected official calls you and says, I mean, I, I've literally been threatened to be fired one time over a traffic light, right? Oh, one gosh. one elected official called me and said, I will fire you if you don't give this developer a traffic light. Another elected official called me, I'll fire you if you give them the traffic light. Oh, gosh. So I had, I had to, and this is a true story. So I had to actually manage that process. And then, of course, a developer is threatening to sue me. Personally, and I was like, look, I don't make decisions based on fear of a lawsuit. Let's talk. We'll we'll get to a solution. 
It took about six months. We got to a solution. Everybody was fine. Uh, not everybody got everything they wanted and I didn't get fired. But so it's like those kinds of things that you deal with on the public sector. And, and then, you know, it's a little bit, uh, I mean, I, I have tremendous amount of respect for public uh, employees, but the stick or the carrot that you have is very different than the one that you have in the private sector, right? Sure. So it, it's, it's, a, it's like you really have to motivate people to or inspire them. I mean, people are self-motivated, but you have to inspire them to do something sometimes without having that carrot or that stick. Because if somebody does a great job, I, I can't give them more money. I can't promote them. I mean, there's a process that you have to go through. So they have to be inspired by whatever the, the vision is and what you're contributing to that vision. Yeah, that's that's really Interesting to think about it in that way. You know, people often have conversations about the difference between working as an engineer in the public and private sector, but really having experience and yeah. kind of leadership in both sides is very interesting to hear that. Mm-hmm. All right. So the last question I have for you, Mike, is what would you say is the most important trait or skill set for engineering mm-hmm. professionals to have in the world that we live in today and that we work in today? What, what would you say to that question? Yeah, it's a very interesting question because I actually think about this in the context of leadership and, and uh, you know, every staff meeting here we do, I have like one word that that kind of like the theme of that meeting and I talk about it a little bit. Like an example, we just had a staff meeting a few days ago and my theme was limitless, right? It's like, how do you remove the limits so you can continue to grow and really be limitless in what you can accomplish? But when I think about this, I mean, most people say an ability to solve problems, ability to do this, ability to do that. It, to me, that's all a given, right? Integrity is a given. If you don't have these things, right. you, you, you can't be an engineer. But So I, I wanted to go above and beyond that. And I thought of compassion. And I will define compassion as the desire and the action to improve the human condition. Hmm. That's how I would define it in this case. So I think as engineers, and I've heard other engineers talk about like, why did you get into engineering? Well, I wanted to make the world a better place or I wanted to save the world. Or I wanted to make my community better. And that really, to me, all fits under compassion. We have one planet. <laughs> we have, you know, hopefully many, many more generations to come that are going to inhabit, inhabit this planet. Yep. And we have to leave it better than what we found it. And to me, like, you know, every project we do, if you think about the way projects used to be done, let's say in the Robert Moses era, they were done with no compassion. I mean, you just go through a neighborhood, you wipe it out and you put a highway. Projects are there to serve the communities, to serve the people, not the other way around. So unless you have compassion for the human condition and, and wanting to make human beings' lives better, then you're really not doing engineering in the right way. To me, it's it's about that. That's great. No, I love that. It's 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 interesting too because I earlier in the week I interviewed Joey Hudnall, who's the CEO of Neil Schaefer. They're based out of Mississippi, five six hundred person civil firm, and I asked him a similar mm-hmm. question, and he he mm-hmm. gave a similar answer actually, and he actually said That's that. Good. There's a book that he, it's called Love Works, and he sent me a copy of the book, mm-hmm. and he said it's all about compassionate leadership. So it's interesting because mm-hmm. I'm hearing from different leaders throughout our industry about the, I think the answer to that question in years past is a mm-hmm. lot of times revolved around communication and, and this and mm-hmm. other things, like more hard skills, like you said, whereas it's, you know, mm-hmm. the the emotional side of things is very important today. Everything we've gone through the last few years, you know, people mm-hmm. are, you know, it, there's leadership is is people really at the end of mm-hmm. the day, and I think that that's the compassion is a really good, I think, skill set or ability to hone and always work on and always think about as mm-hmm. a leader, because it can you have to be able to interact with people to be a great leader, and I think that whether regardless of the industry, but especially in engineering, because mm-hmm. we don't think about that all the time, it's mm-hmm. it's so important. That's why I don't like the words project management all the time because it leaves the word people out, which a big part of project management is people. Like, yeah, you can manage the scope, schedule, and budget, but if you can't interact with people, you're not going to be able to manage those three things, essentially. So, Absolutely, yeah. But You know, the pandemic uh, taught us many things. Yeah. Uh, But one thing I always tell people is, you know, we we talk about hybrid work environment and all that. I, I tell people human beings are not designed to be six feet apart. You know, people are social. 
So, uh, you know, we're, we're back in the office three days a week because we don't want to lose the culture. We don't want to lose the interaction. We don't want to lose the friendships that you make and the mentoring that you may, you know, do and all that. So, That's but great. we wanted to allow some flexibility as well. So, you know, I mean, we, we do a lot of work that, that it, like I said, in urban em environments, a lot of times it's uh, communities have been underserved historically. So we think about, a lot, uh, you know, that a lot about like what our work is doing actually to improve somebody's life. And, and that's why I love what I do. That's awesome. Well, Mike Shama, president and CEO at Sam Schwartz Engineering. Mike, thanks so much for spending some time here with us on the Civil Engineering CEO. We really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Michael Shama, president and CEO of Sam Schwartz Engineering. It was really a fascinating look at leadership in both the public and private sectors, which is a question that we get all the time from engineers. I hope you enjoyed it. Please consider subscribing to our channel here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.